Today's video is Core Practical 15, a core practical that goes with the nuclear radiation topic. And this core practical is officially called Investigating the Absorption of Gamma Rays by Lead, but really it's a fairly simple premise. You have to figure out how the thickness of the lead absorber affects how much gamma radiation is absorbed by it. Uh, and to do that, we're going to find a quantity called the half thickness, which is the thickness of lead that absorbs half the original quantity of gamma radiation being detected by the GM tube. We are going to use graphing software to do this, just as a demonstration, and you can do that for your core practical as well. However, very frequently in paper three, there is a graph. So far, always in paper three, there's been a graph. And so far, always, that graph has been a log graph. So it is a good idea to get some practice in processing log data and drawing log graphs. You set up the experiment like this with your geiger muller tube connected to its counter and then at a fixed distance. So you make sure that your source and your GM tube are at a fixed distance from each other and that does not change throughout the experiment because obviously that is going to be a variable. And then you just leave enough space to slot your absorbers in. Now, obviously, you'll be slotting different thicknesses of lead absorber here, so you need to test and make sure that you can get in the thickest absorber in the distance that you choose, because your distance should not be too much, depending very much on your source. For most school laboratories, they have fairly calm sources uh, that are quite old. And so if you put it at a large distance, you might find that as your thicknesses get greater, it drops to zero too fast. So you need to perhaps do a little preliminary testing to see what is the ideal distance that is going to give you some difference with the lead absorber, but not so much that it drops to zero too quickly? The first thing that you have to do with this setup, and preferably before the sources are even in the room, is that you have to find the background. And it is a good idea to do all of this on the same day. If this experiment carries over into another day, you'll have to redo the background count. So. The idea is that you do it over quite a long time, let the equipment run, again without the source, for about five minutes, and do a repeat or two repeats of that, or you can let it run for one minute and just do that several times, because the idea is that you want to have a, an average background radiation so that we can correct our count rate, and more about that in a moment. The other very important part of this experiment is that you must realize how to keep yourself safe in using radioactive sources like this. So these are the rules for school laboratories that should be followed when using radioactive sources. Under 16s, it has to be demonstrated. So presumably if you're taking A-level, you are over 16, not a problem. You always use tongs or tweezers to pick up and insert the source into its holder. You never pick it up with your hands. And you always try and point it away from yourself and other people. So keep it as far away from you as you can and then make sure that it is never pointed in your direction so that when you put it into its holder, again, it points away from you. The end of the Geiger-Muller tube should be facing you so that the source is pointing towards that. You obviously never crack it open, and you always take it out for the time you're going to be using it and then put it back in again. You should be keeping a record of every time the radioactive source is used, and when they're not used, they've got to be locked away in a lead line covered in a specific room. So these, it's good to take a note of a few of these. If you're asked a question about safety, you may be expected to produce three or even four of these in a practical question. So make sure that you've got those ready. I have a set of sample data here. This is the actual data that is taken during the experiment. So you change the lead thickness and you collect the counts per minute. In this case, if you have a very active source, you may prefer to do it in counts every 10 seconds or every 30 seconds, and then divide that by the number of seconds to give you counts per second. But this is our raw data. Now, ideally, you would repeat this up here. Again, this is sample data, so I'm not going to do that or show that, but you should show a series of repeats with an average count at the end. One of the things to remember about raw data is that it all should always be given to the same number of significant figures. Now, obviously, counts per minute are going to be whole numbers, so that's not a big problem. But in other experiments, too, 
you need to ensure that you've got the same number of decimal places in all of your specific raw data. So obviously you don't need the same decimal places for different variables, but within one variable, within one column of your table, keep your decimal places consistent. You'll note too that I've made a note of the background here. And this gives you some idea of what you should be doing with process data. So the background count was taken for five minutes, uh, twice, giving a value of 73 and 67. And of course, we divide that by five to get the background count per minute. Now, 73 divided by five does not give you 15, but your process data, as in these two, cannot have more significant figures than the raw data that it comes from. So you must make sure that you are keeping the same number of significant figures from raw to processed. And of course, that then gives us a mean of 14. So this is our average background radiation in one minute. And this is what we use for the corrected count over here. And we're calling our correct, corrected counts per minute n. So all I've done is subtracted each of these numbers, subtracted 14 from them to give this. That is what you do with the background. That is why you measure it. With this experiment, we will find that we have an exponential decrease in the counts per minute as the thickness of the lead increases. And so we need to process this data and calculate the natural log of each value of n. Please make a note of how you should be writing these units at the top. This, again, is specifically mentioned. You have to write, when you do log to base 10 or log to base e, it is ln bracket with the quantity slash unit close bracket. For all log graphs, that is how you will label your table and your graph axes. They are very specific on that point. Another thing you should note about this is that we always give log or ln data to 2 to 3 SF, depending on the values. And that is regardless of the number of SF in the raw data. That's because frequently you'll find if you go to too few SF, then all of these numbers would be the same. So if you look at these, for example, if we left it at 1 SF, which we wouldn't do anyway because of the raw data, but if we did, the vast majority of our numbers would be a 5, and then we'd have a 4, which isn't helpful. Even at 2 SF with this, we'd have a couple of repeats of the same number. So... It's a good idea to put all of your log values, whether it's to base E or to base 10, 3SF, and that will allow you to differentiate one point from another. The relationship that is governing this, the relationship between the thickness of the lead and the count, is given by this equation. Obviously an exponential equation. X here represents the thickness of lead. C is our count per minute in this situation. Mu is a constant value. And so we are going to take this equation and we're going to log both sides of it. And in logging both sides of it, we get that. I'm going to do a little rearranging of that so that it's a little clearer what the relationship is going to be. And of course, that is in the form of y is equal to mx plus c, which means that we are going to be plotting ln c on our y-axis, and we're going to be plotting the thickness of lead on our x-axis. And we're expecting to get a straight line with a negative gradient and a positive intercept that corresponds to the log of our original count rate, the starting count rate. So this is what you'd be doing. I'm going to show you it as done on Excel, as was this table. Again, it's a good idea to practice plotting these. Here is our graph. You can see, again, note the label for the y-axis and the positioning of the brackets. That's very important. We've got our ln count rate on the y-axis and the thickness of lead on the x-axis. And as you can see, it comes out as a lovely straight line when you do a line of best fit. Remember that the equation that is governing this is LNC equals minus mu x plus LNCO. And that's y equals mx plus c. So we're going to be able to find this quantity, 
which is just an absorption constant from the gradient of this graph, which is why I've put the equation of the graph down here, and that gives us a minus mu of equal to minus 0 0.0589. Now, how do you find the half thickness from this? If we go back to our original version of the equation, we know that the count rate is going to drop to half when C is equal to a half of CO, or C over CO is equal to one half. So let's substitute that over here. C over CO is going to be equal to e to the power of minus mu x. If we put in our half is equal to e to the power of minus mu x, and now log this. So if you take the natural logs of this, we're obviously going to do the natural log of a half is equal to minus mu x. The natural log of a half is 0 0.69 minus 0 0.693. And of course, this is x half now, which is the half thickness. That means then that our half thickness of lead is going to be 0 0.693 divided by mu. Let's put in our values. So for us, 0 0.693 divided by 0 0.0589, that gives us a value of 11.8 millimeters. And that is the thickness of lead that drops the original count to a half.